statistic, and they're saying something like 47% of the oil now is going to be controlled by BRICS nations and a little over right. 2% by, by the U.S. What are your thoughts on that? And and they're talking about backing the BRICS with gold, like having a basket, right? Yeah, so yeah, part of this is that Saudi Arabia and China are already working on a deal to trade uh you know, you want for oil and basically cutting out the petrodollar. And that's the big concern over the last, since I've been in the business the last 15 years, everyone's talked about these countries, these brick nations pulling and moving away from the petrodollar because the, the petrodollar, our dollar is what they would use for these large transactions. And it's slowly just dwindled. You know, the dollars just dwindled and dwindled and dwindled. Uh, on these large transactions, but you got to watch out for the brick nations because... Hey everybody, Rex Bear Leak Project. How the heck are you? Beautiful day today out here in Southern Colorado. And we have a fantastic guest today, a fan favorite. How many emails I get asking to get you back on the show. So thank you very much, Colin, for spending time with us here at Leak Project. How the heck are Absolutely. you? Yeah, Rex, anytime, man. I love, love chatting with you and, uh, you know, excited to be on here and answer all the tough questions that you have. Right on, because I have a few tough questions. So, like, we'll just jump right in. But oh, one question I was going to ask you is one of the emails that I got. You sent me out this really nice. It's a one quarter ounce gold coin. It's a King Charles coin, so it's one of the limited collector coins. Do you yeah. have have any of these left? We don't have a lot left, but we are offering until we run out of them. We're offering for any qualified IRA um you'll get that coin for free um and it's a quarter ounce of, uh, of gold probably worth you know six to seven hundred dollars uh somewhere in that range because it is a limited edition coin um it was the first coin that wasn't the britannia which is kind of their main coin this is the first other coin that they had king charles on and it's a gold standard coin um because they they actually had a gold standard in the UK long before we did, um, but it's a very cool quarter ounce gold coin. And so anyone doing an IRA, um, we we will send those out to you uh, if you qualify. And if we run out of that coin for whatever reason, we'll send you equivalent gold uh, for, for that uh, promotion that we have going on. So it's great. It's a great, great coin. I actually have, funny enough, I brought out today, I have this, uh, I, I love this coin. This is a one ounce coin. With the queen on it, uh, it's a Canadian maple leaf uh, coin here. Uh, everybody misses obviously the queen, and uh, so I got I got some one ounce pieces here that I just have for fun. Uh, always fun to have some good product in front of you. So, uh, but yeah, no things are uh, things are picking up. I think it got an election year. Uh, we've been busy. Noble Gold's been slammed uh, since we got back from the holidays after new year's we've been really busy and so it's uh it's been quite exciting and uh price of gold's you know hovering around 2000 silvers in the 22 range um a lot of reports they're talking about you know three thousand dollars is the new target for gold uh last year was a massive buying of central banks one of the biggest that we've seen in a long time uh central banks bought a ton of gold last year especially china and russia uh, there's other countries that are mixed in there that bought a lot of gold too, but uh, the demand for gold on the physical side has, has been fantastic. Obviously, Costco came out, they're selling some gold. Uh, so there's all these new places that uh, are, are selling gold and pulling all that demand out of the market. Uh, but it's really exciting time to to be in, uh, in into precious metals. It is, man. I remember we were talking off air and you brought up a gentleman that purchased gold from you guys back in 2018. And you said he paid somewhere, you know, in the the twelve hundred dollar range. Um, and I was like, wow, man! Is it? I went and did look back, and I was like, geez, has it been that long already? It's just, it's crazy how time flies. And then it's also very exciting to look at the numbers because I, you know, I I like to collect gold and silver and such. And I was, I read an article the other day after my friend Kevin Hogan which is a big fan. He's actually, we're, we're going to do a podcast. He's going to convert one of his IRAs through Noble Gold and we're going to do a podcast on it. He's a cool guy. But he was, uh, he said something about the um, S&P, about gold beating beat the S&P. So, you know, right. I, I pulled yeah. that up. I was like, yeah. wow, is yeah, that that's pretty about, cool? Yeah, 1999 to today, uh, gold has gone up about 7.6%. 
uh, and the S and P was just around seven percent, uh, which is which has always been you know a big thing that people said is you know with gold is the returns, but I mean 1999 to today that's a pretty good amount of time to prove that gold you know has had a place in today's economy, um, has provided and and I think most people that have built up a nest egg you know, want to have some assets that they can rely on to make that kind of return in their portfolio. Obviously, there's things that will go up, you know, more and there's things that have, haven't done well. But to have something kind of that you can hang your hat on, stable, steady uh, over over that time period uh, is great. And so that's, you know, that's a nice return. I think for most people, if they can kind of make that return consistently, also have an asset that is in high demand that they can always sell, which is nice. Um, you know, that that adds uh, a lot of strength to your portfolio because for a lot of people over the last few years that have been invested in real estate, um, there's been very little opportunity to liquidate uh, real estate at prices that you would want to, you know, liquidate your real estate at uh, because interest rates are so high right now. Um, we'll see what happens over this year. They're talking about lowering interest rates. I think that they will. Uh, but then inflation, the last report on inflation was higher than before. Um, so, you know, it's hard to know what's going to happen. So it's nice to have some, some gold and silver in the portfolio that you can liquidate at any time if you need cash. Uh, cause obviously you never know what's going to happen. Yeah, it's getting pretty hectic. And so I want to talk about that. You had sent me some information. I was looking through the risk review from the FDIC. And I'm like, wow, there's I mean, there's some big red flags. And I'm not a financial guy. I mean, I talk to you a lot and you've given me yeah. a lot of knowledge, but like there's there's some pretty big red flags and some things I was hoping you could share with us about the bank. So like what, here's my question. Let's say that some big banks fail. And let's say that it kind of starts a, a domino effect. Well, could it lead to the FDIC not being able to insure? Like, is that possible that the FDIC could go away? And, and if it doesn't go away, um, how long realistically would it take for somebody? Well, yeah. So last last year when uh, Signature Bank and some of the, there was three banks that failed, Silicon Valley Bank, um, you know, they had to inject some capital uh, to cover some of the deposits. People were concerned about their deposits. There was some potential bank runs there. So they, the FDIC did come up with some loan programs for banks uh, to borrow money if they have liquidity issues. Uh, so they have this fund. It was a little over, um, I think it was around 70, 70 billion that they had available for banks. Uh, and a lot of banks in the last year took that capital uh, because they were having liquidity issues. I believe that if interest rates didn't go up the way that they did, and banks weren't able to offer, you know, four or five percent of the banks, we would have saw 20 or 30 percent more banks fail in the last year. I think the only reason that some of these banks survived is because people ended up staying with some of the banks that they normally would have gotten rid of because the returns on the banks were much higher than we've seen. Right. I mean, we haven't seen four or five percent of the bank uh, probably in you know almost 25, 26 years. Uh, these were pretty high rates that they were offering uh, to keep cash deposits. This year is going to be a problem because it, if they continue to lower rates because they want to stimulate the real estate market, which obviously they need to do, that's going to lower what the banks are going to be able to pay. People are going to start looking at different investments. And I do think that's going to hurt a lot of regional banks, uh, coupled with the fact that just uh, obviously everybody knows the office market um, is really in trouble. They're just not – people aren't going back into the office the way that they uh, – that that people thought. and. And, you know, I was talking to a friend about how much has shifted since COVID. You know, if you just looked at 2019, 2020, you know, you looked at office vacancy in, in major cities, you're looking at four to seven percent vacancy. San Francisco right now has 36 percent vacancy. Um, and actually, it was much higher, but there's been an in, uh, influx of capital into AI. And I guess with those kind of companies, they want some kind of physical office presence. So a lot of the AI companies, these big companies that are raising these trillions of dollars are starting to pick up some of the offices in San Francisco. Otherwise, that vacancy would probably be closer to 50%. Uh, 
which is totally unattainable in terms of refinancing mortgages. I mean, no landlord can survive off half occupancy. I don't even know how they can survive on 30%, 35% occupancy. So you have a lot of this pressure on the banks. And these banks are, are in a bad position because they need liquidity. They need to be able to move things. They, they don't want to take back office buildings that nobody wants. That's not a, a bank's job. They don't want to take back these, these buildings. And if you remember in 2009, when a lot of residential went out of business and a lot of problems, the FDIC actually had to compensate banks because at that time, I mean, in hindsight, you know, a lot of these banks picked up homes at great prices, but uh, in 2010 and 2011, but banks are not set up to own property. That, that's not really what they're set up to do. So their, their job is to keep deposits, make a return on your deposits, make money on loans, make an arbitrage. So a lot of these regional banks are really struggling right now. A lot of these stress tests that you're seeing, and it's not good for the consumer. The, the more banks close, the more of the monopoly fees will go up. It gives less liquidity to, to business owners like you and I. Uh, I don't know if you saw this morning, but uh, Discover uh, credit card is going to get bought out by Capital One. So there's this real uh, uh, consolidation of debt and money that's happening. Uh, and it's not great for the everyday consumer, the small business owner. Uh, you want more banks. You want more options. You want more liquidity out there. And and unfortunately, we're moving in a in a negative direction. Geez, that's I had no idea about the vacancy. That's substantial. Substantial, absolutely. And and you know, commercial debt is short. You know, a lot of people don't realize. You know, when you get a home mortgage of thirty years, you know that's an incredible opportunity to, to have a thirty year mortgage. Commercial debt, office buildings, apartments, uh, industrial. The loan terms are typically three, five, seven, or ten years. So there's a lot of debt in office coming due this year, huge amount, billions and billions of dollars. And they have loans on the books at 3%. And now they're going to have to refinance at 6.5%, plus they have 35% vacancy. So you, you got to look at these numbers and realize there's going to be a lot of vacant buildings all over the country that no one wants. It's not good for the economy. It's not good for jobs. So there's a lot. There's There's some turmoil ahead for banks. There's still a lot of turmoil ahead for for um, uh, uh, real estate in general, um, and that's going to have an effect on the market. It's a lot of people employed in that industry. There's a lot of taxes. I mean, these buildings pay you know billions of dollars in property tax. Uh, that's going to be hard to collect. So it's going to affect everything on the bottom line for a lot of states, a lot of jurisdictions. You know, these taxes that these big buildings pay go to the fire department, the police department. They go to everything that kind of keeps a city going. Um, so that's why people are concerned about potential happening in a lot of these big cities. They can't fund and pay these property taxes. How are they going to fund the police? How are they going to fund the, the fire department? How are they going to fund you know the reserves and everything that they need in those areas to keep things going? So there is a domino effect to this commercial real estate bubble that everybody's worried about. Um, and, and it is going to trickle down to everybody. Are we in a recession right now? I, I think it is. I mean, listen, it, it you know, the key indicator for a recession is misleading in that, you know, they say unemployment's 3.6, 3.6, 3.7%. But if you look at underemployment is close to 8%, which means people that want full-time jobs can't get full-time jobs. So that's a much higher number. And, and then also, if you look at people that have tried to find a job for 18 months that are no longer looking for a job, they pull them out of that statistic. So my, my guess is that unemployment is really much higher uh, that's re reported, and that would re uh, reflect if we were having a recession. Um, GDP came out a little bit slower this year, around two percent. So yeah, those are the two big indicators for a recession. I I, I think we're in there. It it's just very misleading uh, information that's coming out from different places. Obviously, in election year, the, you know the, the Biden administration wants you know positive news to come out about the economy and everything's happening. But if you ask people. I think most people today are saying everything's getting way more expensive than they ever thought. Um, the job that they wanted isn't really paying exactly what they want. A lot of middle management, high paying jobs are gone. So I don't think the economy is as strong as what's reported. I think the only sort of saving grace right now is the stock market looks high and it's higher than it's been. 
but a lot of those profits are you know relegated to five to eight of the larger tech companies, NVIDIA and some of these companies that have really had, you know, incredible gains, uh, but not everybody's invested in those companies. So I, I think I do think some of the economy numbers are misleading, uh, Rex. Yeah, you and me both. And, and you know, it's also I was looking today about the tech companies. So I read an article, 39,000 tech jobs have been slashed right. over the past few months. And then some of these other big tech companies like Google, they're making they're they're making more money than they expected in some aspects, and they're still laying people off. And it seems a lot of that has to do with this new AI integration, artificial intelligence, at least at the surface. But the reason I'm bringing this up is with with this big shift in the economy, with people's jobs, with underemployment, like you had mentioned, could we see a, an actual economic depression like is that possible i, I think it is absolutely i i, I think that we could see uh, listen i think the stock market is is you know it's being propped up so could we see a you know 20 or 25 percent pullback in the stock market in the next 12 to 18 months i think it's very feasible um obviously the real estate market's having problems i mean these are massive sectors that employ a lot of people uh we need these things to be strong um, so, yeah, I, I don't think things are as as good. And, and I think the inflation thing is still rearing its ugly head. And, you know, every time you go to the supermarket, it never seems to slow down how much the price is going up. Health insurance. You know, I'm an employer of, you know, I own four different businesses. Um, my health insurance for our companies has gone up at least 10 percent every year for the last five years. That's a 50 percent increase. So at some point, you know, there's a point there where it's unaffordable. And so you look at Google saying, yeah, they're profits because, yeah, part of it is that Google offered probably one of the most incredible healthcare packages and compensation packages there ever is, which is what a lot of tech companies do. But like if they they don't have to hire people and AI replaces them, there's not only the salary cost, but there's the the bonus on top, which is the, the healthcare and the benefits and all that stuff that they don't have to pay. Um, and so, yeah, there's there's a consolidation happening there. Um and, and business owners today are, are being conservative because as much as like it looks like things are getting better, when you have your health insurance go up 10%, that means you you really have to have significant great profits year over year to cover the increase in costs and some of the other things that you're paying for. Um, so it, it's, it is a tougher time for business owners. And just imagine, you know, a small business owner, someone that has, you know, we have, we're not small at this point, but if we had three or four employees, and I wanted to offer health insurance, and my cost is going up 10% every year, uh, could I charge 10% more in some of the products that I'm selling? Probably not. Um, you're seeing it in restaurants. You know, food costs go up in some areas 15 to 20%. They can't charge 15 or 20% more for a hamburger or, or, you know, whatever they're serving. So they're eating, they're in essence eating into their profits. So there's got to be a, an eventual shift here where inflation really slows down and business owners can actually take a breather. And I think that's when things will start to pick up. Uh, but right now, I think we're still in the midst of a very difficult uh, uh, situation for entrepreneurs. Large corporations are being very conservative in terms of hiring. They may have job postings out there. I've had friends that have looked for jobs and they go on multiple, multiple interviews and then they never hire and then they never fill the position uh, because I think that they're they're looking and they're considering hiring, but they're not really that motivated. Uh, so I, I do think things are a little bit uh, precarious right now. Um, and so we'll see what happens with the election. I mean, big year too. like lots of changes can happen. Uh, the way that our you know presidential uh, situation is set up now, the president can dictate a number of things, uh, more powers than they've had. And, you know, if you go back in the last thirty years, the president has more power today than they had in you know probably fifty or sixty years before that. Um, so you know, a lot can change with a different election. Things can happen, and and uh, you know, couple all that, you have all these wars that we're in: Ukraine, and you got the Middle East. I mean, there's a lot that we're funding as a country. Um, and so it, it makes it difficult to us for us as a country to keep our bottom line uh, under control also. We've kind of lost track on the dozens of billions of dollars that have been sent to fund these overseas conflicts. Right. And, you know, I, I don't want to get into the, the 
obviously the politics of that, it just, it's very, it's very powerful. If you think about the amount of money, like just to think about that, it's, it's jaw dropping. It's, it's mind boggling. And so I, I'm just like, what would be $32 trillion in debt as far as the economy goes approximately. And then we're hearing all these other stories. I'm just wondering how the economy is staying afloat. I'm like, yeah. and, and then talking to you, I'm like, I'm a wall. Yeah. <laughs> Should and, I bring and, my tomato plants in, Colin? <laughs> right. right. Well, and that's the whole thing is that's why, you know, you look at the market and then you go, well, why, you know, why gold, why silver? And it's like, well, why not? I mean, it, it makes sense that these, listen, gold and silver, it, it, industrial demand is, is through the roof. You're looking at, I mean, gold jewelry usage obviously is a tremendous use. Uh, heart monitors. Um, I mean, you go down computers, they're using a lot of gold, silver right now. I mean, they said there's a one, they're going to use about 1.2 million, 1.2 billion ounces of silver this year. It's 176,000 uh, shortage in terms of how many silver ounces they need. So these metals are really in high demand, very hard. And, you know, we're talking about inflation. Obviously, the cost to pull these things out of the ground has gone up dramatically, too. So you have these metals. This is actually I'm holding up talking about silver, but this is actually platinum. Uh, platinum's at a good price right now, too. So you have these industrial metals that make a lot of sense uh, right now in this economy because you're looking at high inflation. You're looking at potential wars, you're looking at a, at a year of, of, of election. So people are, f- you know, fleeing very uh, uh, assets that are a little bit scary and, and assets that they don't feel comfortable with. And they're fleeing into safety assets like gold and silver uh, right now. And I, and I think that's why we've seen a, such a dramatic surge. This year has been the busiest first two months that we've seen in many years, um, just dramatically. Pe- and people, not just people, first time buyers, but people coming back and doubling down on investments. Um, so we've seen a really dramatic uh, surge. And I think people just realize that something has to shift in the economy and they want to be prepared. Uh, so that's why they're looking at, you know, some of these assets and, and they're just looking to just kind of sock some money away and and get it out of some of these riskier investments that are out there. And I think the bank's paying four or 5% is, is a little bit of fool's gold in that it feels good. But, you know, as inflation continues to skyrocket and things go up, you know, I think most people, they need, you need 7, 10, 12 percent to, to really kind of stay even. Um, so the four and a half, five percent of the bank, it feels good because it's safe, but also it's probably not going to get you exactly where you need to be to keep up with the cost of, uh, of goods. So wild to think about, man. It is, it's insane. And one of the things that I think is also insane is silver. So you had brought up, and I'm looking at this right now, global silver demand forecast to reach 1.2 billion ounces this year, the second right. highest level on record, which is what you were just saying. And how are we like, how are we having silver as cheap as it is? Like, when is it, when do you see it just going nuts? Yeah. Billion trillion dollar question. Yeah. I mean, listen, at the end of the day, I think the smart investors, guys, Warren Buffett and all these guys, they always say this, they go, it doesn't matter when that the undervalued asset is going to go up, as long as you're buying an asset that the fundamentals are there, it will go up. And that's that's how I've always believed in investing is that whether the whether it takes a year or six months or two years, it, it will catch up. It, it's not like you're not going to buy an undervalued asset and it's going to stay undervalued forever. As long as the demand is there, eventually the price is going to go up. You, you may be a little early, maybe you're a year early, but I think most people would rather be a, a year early than a year late, especially with silver, because we're at $22. The all-time high is 50. Gold's already broken through its all-time high, right? It's 2070. So I, I think it's better to be a little early on undervalued investments. And I think that's a big reason why we've been so busy. Oh man, I can't wait. Su- super looking forward to that, man. I got some of those fat chunks of silver and I'm just like, yes, the dark yeah. night rises. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, for me, I got a lot of silver too. I mean, more than I would recommend to anybody um, just because, you know, I'm in the business and and I, you know, I feel comfortable, you know, owning and making, you know, and my wife loves silver too. So we feel great about it. We buy it every quarter, but um 
Yeah, I'm I'm a hold to a to a hundred uh, kind of investor. I think I know fifty people will sell. I think there's three digit silver prices, um, and so that's that's my target for for silver, which which I think that's and and I won't sell all of it. I'm sure at that point, you know, uh, I'll keep some. But that's 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 the first time I'm liquidating my my silver, uh, and you know who knows what, where where prices of other things will be at that point. You know, a McDonald's hamburger will probably be like forty dollars at that point too. So, um, you know, the pricing is is definitely going to be relative to everything. But that's the beauty behind metals. You know, if you look at it, you know that's why gold has always been a great investment too. Is if you look at just like you know you go a hundred years ago with a one ounce uh, gold piece could buy the same a hundred years ago and today can buy even more, you know, that's really, you know, that's the value of holding on to an undervalued asset that can only be pulled out of the ground, cannot be manipulated, can't be made, you know, like di- everyone's seeing this diamond thing happen and people are just getting crushed because they overpaid for diamonds that they can now make in a lab. And, you know, for a while there was a stigma about those, but now people don't care. They look identical. No one, no one can tell. You get a two carat manufactured diamond for less than seven thousand dollars that you used to pay fifteen thousand or twenty thousand for. So, uh, but these things can't. You can't. You can't make these things in a lab. So that's one of the great things about it is that there is that hedge uh, of you know the fact that you got to mine this and pull it out of the ground. One other question I'd like to ask you is, and thank you, man. This is this is fantastic. If if I see $75. When I see $75 silver, I'm going to be tempted, you know, but I'd be like, Colin's hanging on to a hundred. Maybe I should oh, hang on to I won't, I won't be mad at you. We'll buy it back from you. Okay. We'll buy that silver back from you. No <laughs> we'll be, we'll be buyers. We'll be buyers of silver at every price. I can tell you that for sure. There'll always be demand. And you know, the, the funny thing about it, Rex, yeah, there'll probably be more demand at 75 than there is at 22, unfortunately for investors. Right. Investors love to buy when it's going up. You know, it's the big unfortunate of the business is that we we typically sell a lot more on the rise than in times like this, where like you know, it seems everything looks like it's a good time to buy, uh, but people want to see movement. You know, they want to see things going. But the big money, they love they love these opportunities uh, in silver. I. I like to follow what the MFers do as far as money funders when they, you know, watch where their money goes. Like you said, they're like MFer, yeah, money funder. Come on, what did you think I was anyway? So, I, I knew what you meant by MFers. Colin knows, but the yeah. chat, they're like, I know a few MFers. <laughs> oh man. Oh, don't we all? They, yeah, they love us. <laughs> they, they love us so much. Um, okay. And, so this- and- Oh, I told you, I got a new, uh, so people should come in, even if you just want to get in our funnel, alert, get emails from us. My silver book, Silver is the New Oil, will be out in like three weeks. So even if you're just at the beginning and you want to learn, come in, hit the link, get your email, call us, because you're going to want to read that book. A lot of what I'm talking about, I'm going to get into more and more depth um, about the silver market. So Please come and check us out, get into our email funnel, learn about what we're doing, because when that book comes out, you're going to want to read it and and it'll take you 10 steps farther than what I'm even talking about today, about all the amazing opportunities, charts, graphs, everything you want to dive in on um, will be in my new silver book. So please uh, give us a call, get get your information in the system, uh, because I think it's going to be really important for people to read this book. Absolutely. I know there's been a lot of the ebooks. When I send people to the link to the website, Noble Gold or leakprojectgold.com through Noble Gold, they'll um, click the ebooks. And a lot of them go there for the ebooks. They love them. This is going to be a full on book. This will be on Amazon. This is like my, you know, my first venture into a full length book. It's not going to be, you know, 300 pages and put you to sleep. It's a shorter version, uh, but it's really, it's called Silver is the New Oil. Really interesting. Um, so we're just in pre-production right now. So for anybody that's interested in learning more, uh, definitely get in our funnel and we'll, we'll get that book out to you soon. Oh, fantastic. Silver's the new oil. I like that. I like that. Okay. Here's the, this, the final question, fine, sir. And this is about bricks. 
So this year, Saudi Arabia and several other nations are supposed to join BRICS, according to what the news is saying. And there was, uh, where did this go? I've got a statistic, and they're saying something like 47% of the oil now is going to be controlled by BRICS nations and a little over right. 2% by by the U.S. What are your thoughts on that? And and they're talking about backing the BRICS with gold, like having a basket <laughs> Right. Yeah. So, yeah, part of this is that Saudi Arabia and China are already working on a deal to trade, uh, you, you know, yuan for oil and basically cutting out the petrodollar. And that's the big concern of the last since I've been in the business the last 15 years. Everyone's talking about these countries, these BRIC nations pulling and moving away from the petrodollar because the, the petrodollar dollar is what they would use for these large transactions. And it's slowly just dwindled. You know, the dollars just dwindled and dwindled and dwindled uh, on these large transactions. But you got to watch out for the BRIC nations because they are either going to come out with their new currency. They're going to be trading uh, independently with each other. Um, you know, just globally, there's been a lot of geopolitical shifts that have been happening. And so when you have two, you know, massive countries, China and Saudi Arabia talking about doing trades, cutting out the dollar. It's not good for our our currency, unfortunately. Uh, so yeah, this is a this is a a development that's been happening. They're communicating, um, and um, you know it's something that to to be cautious of. And obviously, it's going to affect the value of our of our buying power and the value of our our currency. Well, time will tell. You know, th there's been a lot of questions in the past like will the u.s dollar collapse it seems like it's had its moments but man buckle up be prepared not scared and know your options that's what i say and exactly yeah that's the only thing to do is listen you can put your head in the sand but i think get educated give us a call uh 877-646-5347 mention the leak project show get in our funnels we'll start emailing you information and we'll get you at that silver book uh, if you want to talk to somebody live, get some questions answered. But we're here. Uh, I do think it's a great time to sock a little silver away and in your safe or wherever you want to put it. Uh, you know, we're shipping faster than ever, straight to your doorstep. And, you know, the beauty behind Noble Gold is, you know, we sell bullion coins and bars. You know, these are the items here that, you're, you know, we sell. These are always liquid. You can take them anywhere in the world. Anyone will buy these items. So not just us, but anyone. Um, and so if you're looking to diversify with some of these assets, give us a call. Let's educate you on what we do. And, and uh, you know, just happy to be on the show, Rex. And as always, great to, great to see you and be on today. Thanks, Colin. You too. I hope you have a fantastic rest of your week. And keep doing what you're doing because it's awesome. Thanks, brother. Talk Thank to you soon. Talk to you soon.